Relath Hyper Responders. Don't have to worry about LDL cholesterol and ApoB. What's up guys, back with another educational video and this week we are talking about the big release of the Lean Mass Hyper Responder paper that has got a lot of people buzzing because the title basically implies that ApoB and LDL cholesterol did not matter for plaque progression in people with this phenotype. But first, like the video, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment, oh the algorithm. So the LMHR study was a study put on by people in the lower carb community. Dave Feldman helped fund it through his uh, citizen science project. But this paper got a lot of attention because these folks in the LMHR or lean mass hyper responder, they call it a phenotype, basically have the following characteristics. Normal blood glucose, uh, good insulin sensitivity. They do not have elevated triglycerides. They have good levels of HDL. All their blood blood markers are healthy, except they have very high LDL cholesterol. I believe to be included, they have to be above 150. And that's a level of LDL cholesterol that by most medical standards is concerning. And this is a group of people who are also following a low carb diet. So there are certain people who on a low carb diet, their LDL cholesterol shoots up, but all their other blood markers are healthy. Now it took a long time to recruit for this study. And that is because the inclusion criteria were so strict. They were trying to recruit hundred people. And again, it's hard to find people who have all healthy blood markers and only LDL cholesterol is basically elevated. Now, if we jump to the end, their end kind of conclusion was that LDL cholesterol and ApoB lipoprotein did not affect and were not associated with the progression of plaque. Okay, so they measured plaque volume and they also measured non-calcium plaque. Calcified plaque is more stable. Non-calcified plaque tends to be higher risk for some sort of myocardial infarction, those sorts of things, because it's a less stable plaque. So they were looking at this plaque progression and attempting to associate it with ApoB or LDL cholesterol. And what they saw was there was really no association. And their conclusion was that plaque begets more plaque. Once you have plaque in the blood vessels, it causes more plaque to accumulate. Well, there are quite a few people who have already done a takedown or a breakdown of this study. So I'm not going to pretend like I'm the first. Uh, Alan Flanagan did a great breakdown. Uh, Mike Alberts, Brad Stenfield. Um, so these people have, have done these takedowns. I'm not going to be bringing in anything new. But it's important to point out the people who did this study really beat their chest pretty hard about it. Basically, they were trying to say that like it does, it's not associated with heart disease or plaque progression in this population. And first, before we get into the study, it's important to understand the mechanism by how ApoB is atherogenic. ApoB is a protein on essentially non-HDL cholesterol. So VLDLs, LDL, IDLs, they all have an ApoB protein on them. And each particle of these lipoproteins has one ApoB protein. Why is ApoB important? Well, ApoB is the portion of the lipoprotein that causes the damage to the endothelium. VLDLs, LDL, IDLs, they can all penetrate the endothelium. And that's not so much a big deal because just going into your endothelium, if they can pass through, they can pass back out. The problem is ApoB, once it penetrates the endothelium and gets into the intima, it then gets enzymatically modified and retained. So enzymes act on the ApoB protein, causing it and the cholesterol and lipids it carries to be deposited there. Once it's deposited there, it recruits inflammation and macrophages and can cause the development of foam cells. And this is what essentially causes the progression of plaque. Now, they're attempting to say that because of their study in this particular population, you don't really need to worry about it. But these other researchers brought up some great points. This was registered at clinicaltrials.gov. And what's nice about going to clinicaltrials.gov is you can see what the pre-specified primary endpoints were. The primary endpoint was the percent change in non-calcified plaque volume. They did not report that number. In fact, all they said was most people had stable plaque. They did not report the actual number. In fact, they didn't disclose the actual number until they got browbeat on social media about it. Again, this is your primary outcome you're supposed to be reporting. And why did you bury it? Finally, the lead author on Twitter said, okay, if you must know, it was 18 millimeters. 
as a median. Now, it's important to point this out. He's still not saying what the average increase was because median is not the same thing as mean. A mean is an average. Median means the center point number, which leads me to believe that the mean was probably higher than 18 because if it wasn't, they would have told you that number. But I digress. But let's just look at, okay, 18 millimeters on average of plaque increase. How does that stack up against other trials looking at plaque progression? Now, the study's own registered protocol said they expected an increase of seven millimeters in plaque. They got an 18.8 .8 millimeter increase. Two and a half times more than they anticipated. They also looked at something called PAV, which is percent atheroma volume. Now, percent atheroma volume increased by 0.8%, which doesn't sound like much. But these people didn't have much to begin with. They started with 1.6%, meaning in one year, their PAV increased by 50% as a relative amount. PAV refers to the total plaque bur burden. So it's calcified and non-calcified. Their total plaque vo volume in one year went up by 50%. They also stratified them into different categories based on their starting coronary uh, calcium score. And they found that people who had a starting calcium score of zero, which is basically like their, their most ideal person, had a median increase of 0.5%. Those who had a coronary calcium score of over 100 increased by 2.4%, okay? So their PAV went up by 2.4%. So here's another way to look at this. Even their best subjects with the lowest progression still increased their total plaque burden by over 30% in a year. And their worst increased by 150%. Now, how does that stack up against other studies? Well, a 0.5% in their best subjects, their best possible outcome, basically is in line with what you see in progression of people who are at relatively intermediate to high risk of cardiovascular disease. So now we're gonna go through some other cohorts and look at how does this stack up? How does LMHR plaque progression stack up against other studies? Now, again, these have all been covered by other people. I'm gonna give a shout out to Brad Stansfield because he covered this. So I don't wanna act like I'm coming across this for the first time. I'm just putting it on my channel. So shout out to the people who have come before me. In the paradigm cohort, they were looking at people with and without metabolic syndrome. So metabolic syndrome, very metabolically unhealthy, not in a good place. We'd expect to see a pretty rapid plaque progression. They had a progression of 17.8 millimeters in 3.2 years. So a similar amount of progression in a third the time in LMHR. Three times the rate of non-calcified plaque growth. Three times in people who are quote unquote healthy compared to people who are metabolically unhealthy. And then if you look at the people who were metabolically healthy, who didn't have metabolic syndrome, it was an increase of 10 point something over 3.2 years. So about three millimeters per year. Oh, so against them, they increased about five to six times as much, five to six times as fast. Now, what about people who have diabetes and hypertension? Certainly, they progressed with plaque faster than the LMHR folks. Oh! Oh, so this study was co-authored by one of the co-authors of the LMHR paper, and they were looking at people with dyslipidemia, hypertension, with and without diabetes. On average, they saw people without diabetes, but who had hypertension and dyslipidemia, meaning poor blood lipids, progressed at about 29 millimeters cubed over a three-year period. So just under 10 millimeters cubed per year. The LMHR folks without dyslipidemia, without hypertension, progressed almost twice as fast. Those with type two diabetes, plus all this other stuff, I mean like the most metabolically unhealthy people you can think of progressed like 52 millimeters over three years, which you divided out just over 17 millimeters cubed per year. They've still beat them by a little bit. These are metabolically healthy people other than LDL and ApoB, which are sky high. Now let's look at uh, another high risk cohort study. This is people with multiple risk factors like obesity, smoking, dyslipidemia, metabolic syndrome, hypertension. They saw an average progression of about 6.4 millimeters per year. LMHR was three times as fast. I could go on and on comparing this to other cohorts. I think it's very, very obvious that the people in the LMHR study had rapid plaque progression of non-calcified plaque and total plaque. Now, they tried to get around this, kind of burying this data, not directly addressing it, and then, oh, I don't know, 
trying to do some correlation between ApoB levels, LDL cholesterol, and plaque progression. Let's explain that real quick. If you are going to do an association study, a proper association study, you need a proper dosage, meaning you need a varying dosage. All of these people had high LDL and high ApoB. There was no low LDL group, no low ApoB group. A comparison might be, we looked at people who smoked 15 cigarettes a day versus people who smoked 30 cigarettes a day, and we didn't really see any difference in the progression of lung cancer and the rate of progression of lung cancer. Yeah, because it's already so much that you've maxed it out. It doesn't matter. Like, literally, this trial shows more plaque progression than trials of people who are very metabolically unhealthy. This is very basic stuff. And again, just the fact that their primary outcome in the pre-registered trial wasn't even directly addressed in the paper, that should send everybody's radar right up. What am I saying take-home wise? It is very clear that LDL and ApoB are independent risk factors for cardiovascular disease. If you are in this phenotype where all your other blood markers are healthy, but your LDL and ApoB are high, are you healthier and at lower risk for cardiovascular disease than somebody who has high LDL and also high triglycerides, low HDL, poor insulin sensitivity, yes, you're better off than them. But you are not better off than somebody with low LDL and also other healthy blood markers. And in one of these trials, uh, the last one with multiple risk factors that they on average progress six millimeters cubed, uh, per year, they found that people on statins only progress one millimeter per year. I know everybody loves to dog on statins, but again, if you lower LDL cholesterol, if you lower ApoB, you get less damage to the endothelium and you get less accumulation of the cholesterol and lipids in the intima. Just because your lean mass hyperresponder does not mean that you are safe from progression of cardiovascular disease. You need to try to get your LDL cholesterol under control. Unfortunately, the authors of this paper are using this to try to push their narrative that LDL doesn't really matter in this population. Some of them have even tried to say that it doesn't matter at all in any population. And that is very, very dangerous rhetoric. I am just all for transparency. I'm grateful that the scientists who did videos and breakdowns before me brought this stuff up. It is not cool to hide primary outcome data because it doesn't fit with your bias. If I can go back to my great mentor, Dr. Lehman, when I had a study where the data did not fit my hypothesis, I kept trying to shoehorn it in, in terms of like rerunning stuff and trying to figure it out. And finally he said, you know, it sounds like you're trying to get the data to fit your conclusion. And what you need to do is change your conclusion to fit the data. 